Hello, here. everybody. Um, welcome to the Music Matters podcast with Daryl Craig Harris. And I have an awesome guest today, somebody that I've admired for many years and uh, is a legendary rock and roll bass player is Mr. Billy Sheehan. How are you doing, Billy? I'm good, Daryl. How are you? I'm good. So you're in Nashville, right? Yes, I am. We've been here for three years now and uh, we love it. It's just great. Really yeah, wonderful. That's such a beautiful part of the world. I, I love it down there. Plus, it's all music, of course, too, which is it's Music City. They're calling it the new L.A. They're... My wife's a real <laughs> estate agent. She must have. Um, there's so many people calling from California. Oh, ah, well, yeah, <laughs> can imagine, especially these days. But <laughs> Yeah. Sorry but, to say, I love LA and I love California. Yeah, but. I'm I'm actually a Huntington Beach guy myself. I, I mean, I miss that. I live in Vegas yeah. now, of course, but uh, I'm not, yeah, I I'm miss not it, but, so far. But, uh, unfortunately, it was it was just kind of getting dangerous for us to be there. Uh, sure. My wife, you know, poor and she's home alone. So yeah, it's, it's, it's tough. I, I feel for those people back there. I hope it gets straightened out. Yeah, I hope so too. So actually talking about that, so obviously it's been a, a super crazy year. <laughs> um, mm -hmm. How's it, I mean, you're probably not used to being home this much, right? I think it's the longest I've been home since the 70s. <laughs> yeah, I know. Well, actually me too. Like it's it's weird. I'm just, especially the summertime, I'm like itching to go out and, and do stuff. Um, but the good thing about it is no airports. Well, that, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I fly so much. You know, people that don't fly a lot, it's, you know, exciting and it's new and it's cool, but you, you got to do it every, every day. It's, uh, it's just awful. Yeah. So, while yeah. flying with, well, I don't know. Do you fly a ba with a base or do you usually have your stuff on the road? I usually carry one with me, but that oh, okay. also does lead to some problems sometimes. Yeah. Fort I was fortunate. Uh, a wonderful gentleman who worked for United Airlines was kind enough to give me a special status so I could get my base on board no matter oh, awesome. what. And, yeah. Uh, they, I really uh, am thankful to United Airlines. So for I know that's that. always a, you know, that's a stressful thing, right? And sometimes you get on the puddle Ooh. jumpers, it's just not going to fit. <laughs> I, was, I was standing in line at uh, Heathrow Airport. Right. No, sorry. It was an airport in Spain. Oh, okay. And uh, ready to board. And they, two people came over to me in uniform, uh, the, the airline uh, people. And I had flown there with my base and done my thing and done other flights with my base. And I'm standing to get on the flight. They took the little velvet rope, opened up and said, sir, could, sir, could you step up? You're not uh, getting on the plane. We removed your luggage. Oh, wow. Said, well, could you maybe have told me? Yeah, right. No, What's up no. with that? So they just basically <laughs> said, GTFO. I know. Yeah, I know. That's the thing, because you never know, right? Wow. <laughs> Fortunately, some wonderful people in Spain there were kind enough to help me out. And I got yeah. Life. Yeah, I hear you. Yeah, the flying thing is uh, people, you know, it's, they think of the glamorous life of a musician and it's like the stage part's the easy part, right? It's all the other stuff. Oh, that's, that's, <laughs> all, that's all I live for. That, those two hours on stage makes everything else uh, kind of fade away, but everything else is rough. And yeah. I remember going out on tour. We brought a new guy out with us. He just, well, I, I will be great to be out be like a crew guy for the band. What are, right. With, within about a month. I'm going to be a roadie. Like, <laughs> he was in the fetal position literally yeah. crying for his mommy I yeah mean, he, I, was, he was uh you know what man those i mean i've done that i've done backline for a bunch of people i worked at j-lo and miley and and people don't realize what i mean like again like the musician thing they think oh you do the gig you go back but like the crew guys that's a 24-hour job when you're on the road right oh it's it's incredible uh, yeah. and uh it, it's uh well you know it's uh, very satisfying you know those uh, those two hours that you're on stage. It's uh, yeah. there's nothing like it in the world, and I always urge people, you know, to play and perform, uh, no matter in whatever capacity. I yeah, whatever your passion is, right? Yeah, it's a great, great thing. Yeah. So, well, so what do you, what have you been focusing on since you've been home so much? Are you been re recording? What have you been up to? Lots of recording. We're uh, we're up to about a hundred songs now. Wow. We've done for clients. I started a little production team myself. Uh, Ray Lugier on drums from Corn. Oh, right. Dear, dear friend of mine lives here in Frank. Killer. Yeah, and killer player. Scott Bush, he's a guitar player, but he's also a Pro Tools expert and a great mixer. So awesome. We just whip tracks out for people all over the world. We've done yeah. it for people in Poland and uh, Belarus and Russia and China and Taiwan. And yeah, the, the world's changed America. for that, right? It's like, it's, it's good. Now it's a global thing. It's interesting. So we've done tracks for people all over the place. And uh, it's been cool because uh, I've, I've never really been a studio guy. When I play in the studio, I go in and play the songs of the band I'm in. Sure. That we rehearse, get out, and then we go on tour and, and perform them. 
So to sit around and try to figure things out and do different tones and have, and the, have the time about, to do that, right? <laughs> so, so now we, uh, I even played on a couple of uh, country tracks. Don't hold it against me. No, it's all good. I'm, I'm not a country guy, <laughs> but, you know, I, but I, when I do it, I wanted to make sure and do it like they wanted because right. we really want people to be pleased when we perform on their on their record. Right. So one, one of my basses in particular is the bass I used on the Mr. Big Song Wild World, our cover of Wild World. Okay. And for some reason, it sounds either like a fretless or like a stand-up bass. More like a stand-up than anything else. Right. So I'm playing it on these country tracks, and people are hearing it going, is that a stand-up bass? <laughs> I didn't it's know really, they played double bass. <laughs> it sounds like it. Yeah, so cool. it's, it's pretty cool. So uh, you know, it's big, big, fat whole new notes in time, just I implying a couple of things, a few little subtle, slight moves, yeah. and that's what the style calls for. And, and it worked out just fine, and they were very pleased with it. Yeah, that's awesome. I mean, the thing about about your playing is that you have a very distinctive style. How how did you develop that? I mean, because as people know when they they hear you, they know it. I mean, that's that's and that's a unique thing. Well, it just came from playing uh, songs in in bars for decades, right? Uh, song to song to song up in Buffalo and that. Yeah, we started basically in the Buffalo area, and then we spread out to any any place within a twelve hour drive. Right. We could do. From Buffalo, New York, which included a lot of the East Coast and Boston, yeah. New, York, New York City, Pittsburgh, Chicago, uh, all over the place, Montreal, Toronto, all sure. kinds of places, and all over the place. But just playing, because when you play a song and perform it live, you have to do some justice to it. So you got to be able to play that genre, at least convincing, right? to some degree. And so, and we played a little of everything. Uh, the the list I'd like to do a list of the songs I've performed. <laughs> yeah, it's probably show. a long list. <laughs> uh, we did Three Dog Night, Grand Funk Railroad, sure. Bebop Deluxe, King Crimson, Kansas, wow. everything by the Beatles and the Stones and Hendrix and Trower and uh, everything. So yeah, once in a while I remember we did Danny's song, right, by Loggins of Messina or by Kenny Loggins. Sure, just a little acoustic uh, song. Uh, you could call it countrified, but we just did a, you know, a, a nice version of it as a slow song in the set and sure. you have to play it. So it sounds, you can't, yeah, it's, got, it's got to be in the genre, right? Yeah, you can't do it. <laughs> so, so, um, so it was a great lesson to learn that you, you know, and, and at the time I wasn't learning it and I, necessarily, it was just kind of absorbing into me. Mm -hmm. I wasn't paying attention to what was going on and I never thought about developing a style. Right. Uh, I just I just had to play songs and get them right and hear what notes I was doing. And there and was that, a lot of there was a lot of great. I mean, in that Buffalo area, we we have some mutual friends from Buffalo that I've played with. But yeah. that area, like, there was a lot of great players, right? You have the guys, Spiber Jiver guys. There's just like a long list oh, of yeah, great yeah. players. Uh, Ted Reinhardt was the drummer, their first drummer, I believe. And he, I went to high school with Ted. Right. He's quite a famous drummer in the Buffalo area, and we were in our first band together right out of high school. And uh, it was, uh, he was just a great player. He has a lot of great players in all of these northeastern kind of Great Lakes cities because all of them were much more important cities than they seem to be now. Right. I mean, Buffalo sure. was a huge, uh, important city mm -hmm. uh, because of the Erie Canal. That's right. how all the goods, you couldn't go over Niagara Falls, so you had to stop, get on, get in the Erie Canal and take your goods down to New York City. Yeah. And for a long time, Buffalo was one of the most important cities. Uh, uh, in, in the country uh, long, long, long ago. Well, like and, you said too, like there's a lot of in that within like a 10 or 12 hour drive, there's like yeah. major, I mean, you got New York, Boston, all those places. And that kind of breeds, I think that those concentration of great players breeds competition. It breeds, it kind of pushes yeah. you, right? Yeah. Yeah. Cause, cause it was, uh, generally things were friendly back in Buffalo back in the day, but it was competitive. And right. then as, as, as the pie got a little smaller, it got cutthroat and, Got a little ugly, unfortunately. Oh yeah. yeah. Well, what can you do? Uh, so was that when you were doing those clubs? Was that was that with Talus, or was that even before Talus? Well, that was all Talus. We started in about seventy one or two. The original oh, okay. lineup with a guy named Mike Piccolo on drums. Cool. Then it changed to to the second version. Then a third. Then a fourth. Then the 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 version that recorded the sinker teeth into that was the fifth version. Then that stopped. And I was out of the band for about a year. Right. And then we got back 
to the to the fifth version again. <laughs> then that version turned into version two, which was actually the ninth iteration. Wow. And then we changed guitar players again. So yeah. It's yeah. tough, you know, that that doing that kind of club thing and you're on the road and all that, it, it's tough. It takes a toll on people, right? Like, it's hard. It's rare that you see bands in that situation stay together for years. It seems like it's yeah. rare. Well, it can be. But I know now a lot of people talk about how tough the road is. And we just mentioned it before. But right. once I get in my groove, I, I could, if I'm on a proper bus... <laughs> Right, exactly. <laughs> uh, I could go for I could go for years. Yeah, and that's I mean, plus you got your buds around you, your family on the road, and, and it's like that's your comfort yeah. zone, right? Just privacy, and especially yeah. the European buses we got these double decker German sure. buses, and they're just perfect and pristine, and yeah. driving through the Swiss Alps and looking at the oh, it's fantastic. So, yeah, I know it's so gorgeous. It's, so how did um, I'm at a situation now where where I when I tour it's. It's not in a van. Yeah, it's nice. <laughs> it's a better situation. Uh, so I, you know, I, the Van Halen situation, like I know you guys opened for Van Halen, right? You did like 30 days with Talus, I think. Is that how the David Lee Roth thing sort of came about or how did that happen? Yeah, yeah that's how they kind of found out about me. Uh, uh, I remember the first date of that tour on October 3rd, uh, 1980. We were in the dressing room. Uh, we didn't really get a sound check, but we were able to get a line check to go up and make sure everything worked. Sure. Sometimes you don't even get that. Yeah, you, you don't know, right? There and just start, and you go in there, and it can be, it's called a throw and go. Just toss it up and hope, hope that everything works. <laughs> yeah. uh, but, but they were kind enough to, because you can do a line check quick, just make sure everything's, you know, coming through the PA. And then we went, and they, they were already sound checked and gone. Right. Well, so I'm in the dressing room, and it's kind of an L shaped room, and I'm facing the guys in my band, and the hallway to come in is to my right. And they can't see who's coming in. Right. And the door opened and I looked over and it was Ed Van Halen. I never met him. Wow. And he was like, he's real, how old was he then? He was in his early 20s, probably, right? 1980. I don't know. Do yeah, know. I don't know either. <laughs> yeah. uh, uh, and the first thing he said is, which one of you guys is Billy Sheehan? <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's funny. me. I am. It's, yeah, it's me. I, I score. So oh, awesome. Was, I think he may have heard about me from Denny Carmasi. Okay. Who I played with. Uh, with Michael Schenker in 79, we worked on Michael Schenker's first solo record. Right. Den gotcha. Denny was in Montrose. Oh, okay. Rock Candy drummer. Yep. yep. Then he went on to play in Heart later on. A great guy and a great, awesome drummer. He got more gigs from the opening beat of of uh, uh, Montrose, uh, uh, Rock Candy. Right. Yeah, well, that's a big song. Right? Yeah. <laughs> <gigs. laughs> drum sounds so amazing. So sure. maybe Denny may have told him about okay, it. Okay, cool. But we became uh, acquaintances and uh, hung out, and they were very kind to us. And at the end of that tour, Ed uh, initiated for me to get in touch with him, and then things happened uh, after that. I didn't really talk too yeah. much to Dave initially, but then, then we, we we did have, have a, a couple of moments where we – Yeah. How, how was so? How did that happen? Did you just get a phone call from Dave's management when he, when he left Van Halen, or how, how did that take place? Nobody knew anything about what was going on with Van Halen. We got a sure. call, and it was uh, Dave wanted to speak with me about being in his movie. Oh, okay, interesting. What? <laughs> uh, okay, interesting. And so I just happened to be going out to LA to start the tour with Ingve. Oh, okay. That was Ingve tour. Right, right. So I had a day off, so I, they drove me out to Dave's house. And sure enough, he said, uh, there is a movie, but <laughs> that's a cover story because I didn't want anyone to know. I, For sure, yeah. That told was... me I quit Van Halen. I go, wow, holy yeah. shit. So cheaper. So then he said, uh, how about if we do a me? Let's put a band together. We'll find a guitar player. We'll find a drummer and we'll go out. I said... Well, I I didn't say this to him, but in my mind, you know, I, there's no band. I wouldn't leave Talis for any other band right. except for Van Halen. Yeah. <laughs> and then I said, close enough. Yeah, right. I mean, that and that's. I mean, at that point, they're on top of the world too, right? Like they're. I mean, they were the biggest band in the world. They just finished yeah. '84, and it's the summer of '85. Right. Yeah. Uh, um, and then also, so did you? How did that come about with getting Greg and, and Steve? Did, is that calls that you guys made? Did you do auditions, or how did that happen? No, uh, Steve Stevens was the original guy Dave was looking at, and Steve oh, was a okay. great, great player and right. awesome. But he was uh, at, at a commitment with with Billy Idol, so mm -hmm. uh, I told Dave, I know another Steve, because Steve yeah. and I were on the same label, Relativity, out of New York City, 
Okay. And, uh, I had gotten his uh, uh, a flexible uh, record from them. And then they okay. talked about maybe me and Steve doing something together. So I'd actually communicated a little bit. I'm not sure if we communicated directly or not regarding Steve about maybe playing together. Wow. So when I saw him in L.A. after I was already there and people were wondering, well, what are you doing in L.A.? Why aren't you home in, in Buffalo? So, oh, nothing. Good stuff. <laughs> it, was, it was a state secret. We couldn't tell anybody anything. Yeah, and I love, I mean, I, just, I mean, obviously yeah. Steve's like an amazing player, but also Greg. I mean, I love Greg's such a great player. Yeah, well, uh, well, I, and I, I remember I said to Steve, there's uh, something I can't tell you about right now, but there might be something you might be interested in. And he goes, I think I know what you mean. So maybe he had a hit about it. So oh, sure. okay. Yeah. He, Interesting. Uh, I told Dave and Ted Templeman was very uh, into Steve also. So that mm -hmm. worked out great. Then Dave gave Steve and I the task, go out into the wilderness and bring back a drummer. <laughs> So we we uh, we hired SIR rehearsal, me and Steve and and Dave's secretary Karen, and we booked about forty drummers to come in. There was a line down the street of drummers, you know, to come in. Right. And uh, Greg walked in, and the moment he walked in, we knew he was the guy before he even played. Yeah, he's a sweet dude too, right? Just 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 he just had it. And Steve and I looked at each other, and we know. And he, sure enough, we gave him. I think we gave him a tape of the songs we were working on. Uh, because we had actually used a drummer that played with Steve to do some demos, a guy named Chris Frazier, who was an, also an amazing drummer. Uh, so uh, Dave was, for some reason, wanted somebody else. And uh, so we came in with Greg. He knew every song exactly <laughs> before yeah. we even, before the first snare drum hit. Right. So he had it together completely. And uh, Yeah, he's a North, Te North Texas guy. Yeah. Yeah. He's one of my favorite human beings in the in the world. Uh, yeah, and his brother Matt. Well, Matt's now playing with like with Elton, right? I think. Yeah, Elton John's bass player. Not bad. Yeah, right. Yeah, those were both those guys. I saw them. I saw them when I was in high school. They were playing, doing the jazz festivals. I think it was with Maynard, if I'm correct. But could be. I think he played with Maynard Ferguson. Yeah, yeah, it was just badass. Um, that, well, that record came out. So, like, that's when I first actually became aware of you because you were starting to be on the cover of Bass Player Magazine, and and I I didn't I wasn't really familiar with Talis at that point. But when I heard that record, I was like, holy hell, who are these guys? <laughs> and you know, even Steve, I, I kind of knew his name a little bit, but. That that you know, as eat them and smile. I guess it was just killer, killer, killer. How did that come about? Did you guys write together? Or? Yeah, we uh, got together in the basement and we'd be fooling around with an idea. And David say, "Come downstairs." And go, well, that's cool. That sounds like a verse. Now make a chorus up. And we're, okay, now give me a bridge and two yeah. more choruses. And then he'd uh, record it on his cassette recorder. Go out and uh, write lyrics or get an idea to it. Drive around. Uh, he'd have a, his buddy drive around on a convertible while he sat there and wrote yeah uh, cool. and uh, they really uh, uh kind of uh engineered the whole thing interesting uh, so uh he really engineered the uh the whole thing and a lot of other things that i don't know if he got credit for but should have when we started the live show on tour you know i, I go up and do my solo steve would do his solo and hey and but dave you know about three or four shows in dave goes it's not good enough it's not entertaining you know, wow, it's, really. yeah, it's really good, but uh, yeah. it's just he was he was a master showman. I mean, whatever yeah, you think yeah. of him, I mean, he he knows that man for sure. And uh, so he said, "So let's do this. Let's make it like a battle." Uh, Steve, you start playing. Billy, you run over, push him aside, and take over, and then he pushes you, and then you run. Chase. And basically, it was whole, his idea completely. So from that, I, there must be a, a hundreds of bands that took that idea and turned it into their thing. Sure. And I'll see these these bands from some other country doing their doing the show in in, in Japan. <laughs> they got the the guitar player running up to the bass player, and the bass player running to the guitar like, player. Wait, that yeah. looks familiar. You know, they kind of uh, it's been it's been uh, Dave Dave planted that seed. So yeah. So did you? I mean, that was I guess it would have been a life changing gig for you, right? It just really it, it, it kind of ramped things up career wise. Thing, yeah. Yeah, and that's and so. How how long was that? I guess that was like two years with Dave, right? How long was how how long did the uh, the the right? Well, you guys toured. How long was the tour initially? Was that like a year long tour or? Yeah, we just toured U.S. and Canada. We didn't go overseas at all. Oh, really? Interesting. No. Uh, so we started in uh, I don't know the summer of '86. Hmm. Interesting. Went into the winter of '87, I hmm. believe. Okay, and then you um. 
and then with, I, with, with, I with recall, it's, it's the, the good thing about that is somebody has that written down somewhere so <laughs> exactly uh, and then mr big how did that come about well i love dave and wanted to start my own band and uh I uh, wanted to put some great players together. I wanted it to be a vocal band. Talos was a vocal band. We because yeah, you, you sang in Talos too, right? You guys traded vocals. Yeah, we all sang. It was a lot of three-part harmony. But we did Crosby, yeah. Stills, and Nash, and Three Dog Night, and all that stuff. That was all. Awesome. Yeah, when you see Mr. Big now doing It's For You, the Three Dog Night song, that was mm -hmm. a Talos song. We, oh, okay. we played, played that back in Talos. Same thing with all the... Uh, Crosby, Stills, and Nash song. We did Carry On mm -hmm. in Japan, the full Crosby, Stills, and Nash song. That was We did that in Talos also. That was kind of a, a thing for, for Talos was a vocal band. So I wanted to have that. So right. I, uh, I also wanted to have some, some, you know, some great players. Uh, I knew about Paul. He was a, a Talos fan. He, uh, he was, I think he was, attended my very first clinic I ever did. Oh, okay. And wow. we used to play in Pittsburgh and he'd be in the front of the stage watching the band and stuff. He's just a little kid still. Right. And uh, so I knew I knew him and I knew he was a great player. And then I knew Pat Torpy also. I'd seen him around, had some mutual friends. And then uh, we I found Eric uh, to do the vocals. And uh, we got lucky because we got an amazing manager from the beginning, a guy named Herbie Herbert. Oh, okay. He one of the founding fathers of the music business. So that was, he was really the key to a lot of our success. Right. And, yeah. Uh, I mean, we that's. Went on, we, we did a record and uh, we, uh, we use Kevin Elson as a producer, okay. not Keith Olson. Every time we say Kevin, yeah, Keith, Elson. yeah, Keith I remember Olson? Keith from oh, I remember Kevin Keith from Sound Sound City. You mean, yeah. you mean Keith Olson? No, it's Kevin Elson. <laughs> Keith Olson. No, <laughs> it's Kevin Elson. So oh. he's he's working with Keith Olson, and I said, well, you know, <laughs> give up after a while, right? But the Kevin was a, just a genius producer, one of the best live mixes in the world. He mixed the Michael Jackson Bad Tour. Wow. He mixed all Journey always right. everywhere and uh he was just a genius guy and a wonderful man and he actually came out on the road and did our front of house sound too so wow we, we had a re some great great uh pluses in our column uh, from the very beginning that was a, a big help to us so we went on uh first record did okay good but not great and then the second record came out and we had a hit yeah so that must have been like a rocket ship because that was a big song oh it was your number one of 14 countries right to this day i get two or three emails and messages of people from you know bangladesh yeah sri lanka or the philippines or ecuador or finland or belarus all those places <laughs> oh, yeah. you know the thing the thing about it is a song like that with like you said with the vocals and tied in with the video because the video was great too right and that was yeah, really the video was was kind of well actually it's an afterthought because because this thing is going off the charts and somebody goes, we, we better do a video. <laughs> who, who do we know that can do a video? So we managed right. to do it. Somebody from the label found somebody and they just slapped it together quick. But it was like many things. If you don't think it through so much, it's usually pretty good. Yeah, sometimes you it, overthink it, right? <laughs> Same with a musician. If you think, you stink. Right. You're thinking about it, you're stinking about it. Yeah, sometimes you, you, have to get, you have to get out of your own way, right? <laughs> yeah, exactly right. So, so Nancy let's... Bennett. Nancy Bennett was the woman who put that uh, wonderful, great videographer and dear, dear, uh, sweet woman as well. Yeah. Great, great friend. She put that together, made it happen, and, and number one MTV. So I'm pretty yeah, I mean that was that was definitely like the MTV era, big time in that time zone, right? Yeah, the visual is important. So let, let's talk about because you're holding your base. So let's talk about that base. So you have your original Talos base, which a lot of people are familiar with. Yeah, How that's, did, it's on the wall right there. Nice. Very there nice. She is. That's yeah. the wife. Next to her is her sister. And next to that is the 30 year anniversary uh Yamaha. Right. Tribute. That's that's exactly where I'm going. <laughs> so but tell me how how did the Yamaha thing first come about? Well, I in uh winter of eighty four, I think uh I came out to uh I may have come out for the NAM show. Okay. Oh no, I came out, sorry. I came, we came out in December of 84 to play a show at the country club with Talos because we're getting, you know, getting to a point where we're, you know, had a bunch of label interests and we almost got signed and almost got signed again. And so, so we're doing a showcase out in LA at the country club. So we band flew out, crew drove the gear out 
and I had a day off there. And Yamaha contacted me. They saw me in the uh, 1983 is in the spotlight of new on uh, new talent column by Mike Barney. Right. Yeah. Out. And I played Mike. Mike is a legendary guy. He's he's sort of responsible for a lot of people getting. If a lot you, of... he is one of my dearest friends. Yeah. He, he lives is, out here. <laughs> he is hilarious. God, yeah, I gotta he's... get. I got. I know he's up late all the time, and I, I gotta I gotta give him. I get up super early, so I'm gonna call him when I get up early. Yeah, time he's a good. We see him around Vegas. Actually, he's a good guy. Oh, he's the best. I love Mike. He's been done. He found Eric Martin for me, and yep. and uh, he's just just a, just a great great guy. So anyway, we were out there, and Yamaha contacted me and said, you know, we we'd like to talk with you about maybe making a bass for you. And I said, well, I got my P bass, but I knew the P bass's days were numbered because it right. was beat senseless and all the new fenders at that time weren't up to speed the fender's right. great now Fender's as good as it ever was but yeah. now but during the short amount of time there during the uh mid 80s yeah quality was not not good uh so uh i had seen a yamaha bass and i just marveled at how awesome it was put together because i've done a little bit of woodworking myself so i can kind of know what, what what's what's right and what's wrong to some right. degree sure and your experience, you know what you like, so. Yeah, so I went out, uh, they, a friend of mine drove me down to Orange County where the Yamaha headquarters is, and I talked with their people right. there, and they said, uh, you know, we, we'd like to maybe do a bass and, you know, make your things. So I said, like, okay, let, let's go. And I had already actually, pardon me one second. It's okay. I had already had a, a deal with Kramer. Oh, okay. Because that Van Halen with Kramer and everybody, and they, they contacted right. me and said, would I like to endorse the Kramer bass? Yeah, and they were really big in that mid-80s thing for sure, too. Yeah. So I got the Kramer bass, uh, and it was okay. Uh, but there was something, some things about it that just didn't sit right. I didn't know why. So yeah. I went down there to the Kramer factory, and I watched them putting them together. And I said, no way yeah. I can do this. They, it was just just really uh, a lot of big mistakes were being made, and uh, mm -hmm. they were they were so hot they were just churning guitars out because they were selling yeah. so. Hot. And uh, so I said, and they had already sent me a bunch of bases, and I and I was poor as poor could be, driving my '77 Ford Pinto, living in a an apartment <laughs> with three other guys sharing a rent. Right. And and at that time, for me to send all that gear back to them. Yeah, in, indicated that there's no way I I, I could I could uh, in good conscience endorse this this product. right. I mean that's the thing because you get you get if you get I mean not everybody gets free instruments but if you do, you know you want to like them because you're you're doing the deal. But then yeah. if, you, you just, if it doesn't work, it doesn't work, right? Yeah, I, I just couldn't do it. And uh, so uh, Yamaha began then after that meeting that I just mentioned to work on one of their BB series modified for me. Oh, okay. And and then uh, it was okay. And I used it on uh, I used it on skyscraper. I used it on a couple other things. Used it on the Eat 'Em Smile tour for the encore song. Right. It's it's right now at Yamaha being refurbished, uh, but uh, it it, just, it had a wider body, so it just you know I was used to the same bass on me for twenty years. Yeah, and it's a very it, different it, neck from from a precision, right? It's, it's yeah, not, but it was not great bass, but it just oh, yeah. didn't. Work. And if I played only standing up, it would have been. Might have been fine, but but uh, so uh, they started another one called the RBX, but it was designed right. initially for domestic Japan, so it was small because mm -hmm. uh, people generally are shorter and smaller in Japan sure. on average. So uh, it was kind of, and they tried to put a fat neck on it, so it looked ungainly and kind of odd. I have a double neck version of it, which is also getting refurbished right now, which is nice. Yeah. But then we then we went. Uh, a guy named Rich Lasner worked for Yamaha as a designer for a while, and he also he's designed a lot of great iconic guitars for uh, for many companies, uh, artist series, and he he came up with the basis of this. Okay. And, and then we worked from there. And yeah, because it, it's a process, right? Trying to get everything right and getting getting the right size, the right feel. Yeah. Back. Yeah. Well, Yamaha is an amazing company. They managed to. I remember the first version that came out, the first prototype. I was in Japan. Oh, and I said, here's the real test. Can I just put it on and go up on stage and play it? Right. Sure. Without anything. And I did. And uh, I thought that was impossible because I, I got to micro tweak every little aspect of every bass. Yeah. It, it was great. 
It played great, sounded great. And yeah, I, I love it, you know, because I, I was in uh, Tokyo with uh, Cirque, Cirque du Soleil for four years. And I had a that's good right. That's right. Yeah, a good relationship with the Yamaha Art guys, which is our artist relations team there. And like, they're all about making it right. Like their attention yeah. to detail. And, you know, and I guess it's Hamamatsu, right, is where the, the custom. Hamamatsu is, is a city, yeah. Right. And they uh, they have a they have a, a couple offices in the Tokyo area too. But yeah, the Shibuya. Yeah. Um, yeah, that's that's a good. You know, the company is great, and the thing about Yamaha too is they have the power and they have the the resources for that for the ads and for the. And I think that's really kind of also brought, you know, a lot um, to to what you do because it helps spread the word, right? Um, yeah, it's uh, it's nice to be with a big company. It's the same as a record uh, label. Right. And you were the huge label. They got the power to do stuff, but you it's, hard, think, it's, right. it's hard to turn. You got this giant ship in the water that you got to turn, and it takes a long time for it to make that turn. <laughs> Where a little label can do all kinds of things real quick and right, but right. they don't have that kind of uh, the so muscle. It's a trade off. It's a trade off. Yeah. It's a one half dozen of the other. And then but you, they, they've been great, and they do have a lot of uh, personnel here in the USA now that are in yeah. charge of a lot of things. Where before it was always Japan centric. Mm -hmm. which was great, but it took a long time. So yeah, now, they got the Yamaha yeah, guitars in Burbank and all that. Right? Well, actually, they're in uh, out in uh, Thousand Cal Oaks now. Oh, in, right, Calabasas. Because yeah. um, uh, they bought Line 6, and so Line 6 is there, too. Yeah, yeah, it's always, that's funny, because actually it's always, they also now they have uh, Ampeg, too, I think. So it's like they're always Yeah, kind of well, it's, a, it's a nice group of uh, gear. The Line 6 stuff I love. Yeah. The Yamaha, cool. of course, I love. And the Ampeg, well, I don't use it anymore, but... Right. certainly as a, as, a, as a place in my heart. Yeah, it's a classic. Um, so also you have a, had a long standing relationship with uh, DiMarzio. And yeah. you just designed a new pickup, right? A new version. Um, tell exactly. us a little bit about, about that. Oh, it's uh, exploded too. It's uh, People have been going crazy for it. I'm really pleased and uh, had several conversations with Larry DiMarzio about it. And we're, you know, they're, they're really doing great. And I'm, I'm glad to see a couple other players that like have an eye. If you have the fender cutout, which is that shape, that, right? That, the traditional, yeah. It's, it's pretty standard. And any company that makes replacement pickups for bass, they'd make it in that configuration. Right. So I've had people write to me that you have all kinds of different bases that have put them in and love it. Yeah. So basically, um, this is one of my versions of it from years ago. <laughs> and I, the pickup is rounded. And the little things that hold the screw are down, are lower, so that screw isn't yeah. in your way. It's more player friendly. <laughs> yeah, way more player friendly. So I, I gave that idea to uh, Larry, and he ran with it and did a couple of unique things that were his idea. Hmm. The whole of the pickup is now in a shell of nickel, oh. which, which is non magnetic. Right. Only through with magnet uh, magnetic uh, pull, but it shields the pickup completely. Right. So, so it's super no, quiet. Yeah. There's no interference and noise at all. It's incredible. And the pickup is actually built on a little circuit board. Oh, interesting. And yeah, uh, I've seen, I've been seeing a lot. I mean, they're doing a great job promoting that. And, uh, yeah, it's been great. And I'm getting uh, constant emails of people that have not put them in and love them. Awesome. One bass player friend of mine, he said, every time he plays, the engineer, you know, gets on the talk back. He goes, what, what kind of bass you got there? What, what yeah. the heck is it? Got a big up as that, you know. It sounds yeah. great in here, you know. I know, and it's funny because I've had all sorts of different bases, you know, over the years, and all the fancy stuff and the electronics. And I actually, I always go towards this P bass. That sound, recording yeah. wise. Yeah, for me, know. it's one less thing to worry about too. You can go bananas and put, you know, pack this thing with all kinds of electronics and right. wiring, and but this just the basic wire wrapped around a magnet. Yep. With volume control, amp. Yep. Leo, Leo, Leo knew what he was doing. He did. He did. <laughs> it, it stood up well. So now, now you have the 30th anniversary, right? Yeah, yeah. It's uh, it sold out. Wow. Yeah, they sold out everywhere. There was uh, only 30 of them though. So I, oh, okay. They made a hundred thousand and sold out. Uh, we, you know, that'd be nice. But uh, but they wanted to do a limited version because they wanted to really fine tune the uh, uh, oversee the quality control really right. tight. They wanted it to be a very special thing and not just churn them out. Yeah. So they're, so they're all righteous. They are very yeah. righteous. And I've seen on my Facebook, I got number four, I got number 20. I got, you know, <laughs> people that have gotten them around the world. And I'm very, very thankful for that. That's awesome. Uh, it's, it's, it, thing plays great. I've used it on stage live a couple of times already. Oh, great. When, just, when were those, when were those released? It was pretty, pretty recently, right? A couple months ago. Okay. Wow. 
yeah they're gone so i i only had that the only one i have is the prototype i don't, oh, I don't okay. even have one yeah, yeah. <laughs> so, you know you know what's great about what's great about yamaha is and i have you know i was a yamaha guy for a very long time um and even their less less expensive bases, everything's solid. They all play oh, I, well. Yeah, uh, uh, my engineer has a two hundred dollar Yamaha acoustic. Yep. People come over with all these amazing acoustics to record. Yep. And uh, of incredible name value, very expensive guitars. They go, hey, try the try the Yamaha. Yeah. <laughs> let's, let's use that. That's yeah, amazing. they just, I, it's something about the, you know, the, the culture in Japan, like they, they just really, they work really hard to make it right. Yeah. Um, and that's something I really, I miss actually not living there because it's just a different, it's a different world. It's it's a challenging world. I know you guys have always been like Mr. Big was gigantic in Japan, right? Um, and you, as that, I guess that's probably a country you love going to, I would imagine. Well, well, Japan is a lot of great memories. We, I've been there, I think over 65 times now. Wow flown to japan doing tours and promotion playing yeah. with other people there and stuff like that so i've gotten to know the people and the culture and the country very very well and it's an amazing experience especially as an american of my age because we grew up we're the post-world war ii generation right. and all we saw were movies about you know killing germans and killing japanese people and to know germany now and the friends i have there now yeah exactly and the wonderful people uh it, it was really enlightening and the same with Japan mm -hmm. uh, just to go there and sweet, polite, incredible people. Yep. I don't know what the heck happened way back then when both cultures got hijacked by yeah. evil. It but, happens. Uh, yeah. but it does sadly, but now uh, I just love Japan. Uh, and have so many friends there. Same with Germany too. It's, it's, it's and you also do, I mean, you do a lot of clinics. Is that, did you enjoy doing those? Very much. Yeah. It, it, I learn more from them than the attendees usually. Interesting. Okay. A lot of times people ask me a question. So how do you do? And I go, mm, yeah. let me think about it. <laughs> See how I do that. <laughs> well, yeah, I had no idea. Yeah. Because I, 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 we were talking before about thinking, and I, I don't really. And that's why I'll, you ask a question about how I develop my style, and it relates also that you don't really think it through. These things kind of just happen. Right. So when you're playing and this thing happens. Okay, and you don't really set, spend time dissecting. Well, well, the reason why it works is because this minor diminished yeah. went into the. I don't know, so. That's so, that's but, something that people ask me about. Like, how hey, you do teaching? I'm like, I like to teach, but I actually more view it as coaching because I don't think exactly. of things like you said. I don't think like I'm going to play a mixolydian here. <laughs> yeah, and then I think musicians that do that. No offense, but I think you. It's like when you're speaking and when you're talking to someone. And sometimes they are not listening to you. They're just thinking of what they're going to say next. Exactly. So they're not, it's not really a two-way communication. That's the interview so, thing. Like, <laughs> exactly. So, so uh, uh, for you to be playing, you it's, it's got to be analogous to communicating mm -hmm. to another person because you are as a group yeah. of people. You got to be in the moment. You, yeah. But you're, yeah, but you're communicating, you're communicating back and forth. If you're thinking about what you're going to say instead of just speaking, when you see someone that speaks from a teleprompter right. and they do it, and sometimes they can do it really great, and it seems like they're really saying it, but you right. found out later, no, they were reading the whole thing. They just yeah, they're not, yeah, yeah, they it's different. It, put in a couple of ums and ahs to make it sound real. But then when you see somebody that's just speaking, even though it may not be as articulate and grammatically perfect, it touches you more. Right. So in the, in the same way, I don't know music theory or, or, or uh, I can't read music. I don't know what a lot of things, I know some things, but I, right. I mostly I don't. Yeah. I know how to play it, but I don't know how to explain it because, uh, you know, but I, it's, uh, so I think that's a, that's a very important point that a lot of young players miss is they're thinking it through and they're thinking about it and they're trying to, how do I develop a style? Right. You don't. Yeah, and, you just and, have to you have to go out there and, and do it. Play. Yeah, you just go out there and play it eventually. Oh, look, there's a style there. Yeah. I mean, the thing about music, too, is it's really about communication and connection. And, and like you said, if you're too into your brain thinking about stuff, you kind of lose that in some way, right? Yeah, and there's nothing wrong with intellectual music that, that right. is put together with some forethought and constructed in a way along the rules of music or bypassing mm -hmm. the rules. That's cool. But when you perform it, you've got to own it. Right. If, you're, if you're sitting there, you know, like robotically doing the parts, though, in all fairness, that's art too. Yeah. 
I mean, yeah, and it's also learning the gig. If you if you get on a new gig, you got to learn the parts, and then but at some point yeah. you got to get past that, right? Yeah, and, and, you know, it, it's all art, even if it's done robotically and with total thought, yeah. with no heart and no soul, it's still a form of doing art. And we yeah. sometimes we need to see the opposite end of the spectrum, right? To, to get relative to where. The other side of the spectrum is yeah yeah and it's everybody has something to bring to the table it's and you know people like different things which is all good i believe so i believe yeah. so and as much as i uh like there's a lot of types of music that i don't really like and i don't listen to i don't listen to country music really but once yeah. in a while i'll hear i did a i did a recording with this girl named hillary klug and she's mm -hmm. a clogger oh. with hands on the board. <laughs> i think i want to see the video <laughs> she dances while she plays the violin oh, just okay. as it keeps rhythm with her feet but it's kind of a dance right right total americana total country yep. it's so charming and so endearing not not my thing but i yeah. i think she's fantastic and i love it and i can listen to it yeah similar to uh uh there's just a lot of types of music that, I, that aren't my thing but you you can find something about them yeah and you can appreciate the the passion and the and the effort it took to make it happen right i mean even if you don't take yeah, like the style yeah. There's always a long story behind how that came to be for everyone. Yeah, true. So what, what's the, um, looking forward to next year, hopefully we all get back to work uh, musically, but what, what's coming up for you in the, in the near future? Well, we're just about to finish a new Talos record. Oh, okay. Uh, now, uh, Talos was, uh, that's the version of Talos that I left in 85 to go join Dave. Okay. And instead of like rewriting the songs better, and smarter because I know a lot more now than I did then. Sure, yeah. Let's do it like we did it when we did it. And so we're doing exactly a little snapshot of what we did back in 1985. And uh, awesome. And uh, from the heart and for real. Right. And uh, it's it's really cool. It's shaping up for there. The drummer Mark Miller is as good as ever, and he was just one of the greatest drummers. Actually, Dave Roth flew him to L.A initially to check him out on drums oh, okay. because he, he had come to see talus a couple of times sure uh, after i had that first meeting with him oh. we went, went again on tour right and so unfortunately mark was he was a he was got married and his wife was gonna have a baby and he just wasn't in the yeah, timing was wrong so, um that's that's exciting actually I, I, i'm sure there's a lot of talus fans out there that are, are excited to gonna to get that yeah. when it gets out well we're doing all songs that we never really recorded in the studio some we did oh. on on the live live speed on ice record but okay. uh they're never recorded for real in the studio so they're all all those songs and all the songs from our live set which we never recorded right uh, so, uh, it's it's uh but there's kind of just a snapshot of the way we left it back when we did what's going on with the uh the winery dogs which is, which is a band i love that's <laughs> so good i love that band too i love so good i love playing with mike and uh i love those songs yeah. And it's a vocal band too. All three of us are singing, which is great. Uh, hoping to be able to get together and start writing very soon. And that was the plan. Mm -hmm. The plan was initially we're going to continue on with Sons of Apollo through this year, okay. up to about the summer or fall. Right. Also an awesome project. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah, I love that band. Also, uh, Derek, Ron, uh, Bumblefoot, uh, Jessica Soto, myself, and Mike. It's a joy to play with those yeah. guys really great so uh and richie was going to continue on because he had his 50 year anniversary 50 birthday uh 50th birthday uh record 50 for 50 wrote 50 songs <laughs> cool i remember he called me about the, at song 3d he goes I don't, I don't know if i got it anymore but he did he <laughs> pulled it off and actually really wrote songs too he didn't like pick up old demos and try to redo them you know the he, thing about him that he, he's another one of those guys as soon as you hear him you know it's him he has a very unique thing playing wise right. and singing it's, it's killer yeah superstar i i don't know uh, i know few guys that play and sing yeah as well. man it's so so uh soulful and you guys at, at that combination of the three of you all have like your own unique flavor right yeah the rhinery dogs are really really nice so that was the plan and richie was going to finish like around the end of the summer or the fall and we're all going to get together so now richie mm -hmm. couldn't tour at all for his 50 for 50. Right. winery dogs had to stop uh our fourth show into the european tour we had to turn around oh wow okay so everybody's out of biz and right. uh, so hopefully uh we can start writing with the winery dog soon i can mm -hmm. there's no guarantees but that's what that's what we're shooting for yeah and i hope to maybe cut, cut a couple tracks in the meantime to as a placeholder for sons of apollo if that's possible 
Right. So we'll see what happens, but I'm, I'm up for anything and everything. So we'll, yeah, it'd be awesome. But maybe maybe some kind of a live stream show with them would be fun too. I mean, I, it seems like that's been the thing lately is, is trying yeah. to put all that together. I'd love to do it. I'd love to do it. So it's okay. I, it was I came up with the idea. <laughs> I'm sure it's been suggested, but uh, I think that that's you know that's been I mean I guess that's been a savior for some people just being able to get their music out there. But the live stream thing with the internet, I mean, otherwise it would be there wouldn't be much going on, right? Yeah, uh, as much trouble as the internet is sometimes as we yeah. just with this. <laughs> yeah, the Zoom, the Zoom, yeah, Zoom fun. Well, Zoom is uh, really taken off. It's uh... yeah. Actually, you know what? I mean, the thing about it is, like, I, I have a studio here that I use in Vegas for podcasting. But this is so much uh, more convenient, um, and for also for people like you, which I, you know, you're, unless you came to Vegas, I wouldn't be able to really access you. It would have to be by phone. So it's nice to have the option with yeah video yeah, you, and. You come in town for a show. There is no spare time. I know exactly right. Yeah, get into the venue at noon. Start warming up. Blah blah blah. Sound yeah. check. Eh. Maybe eat. I hate eating before I go on stage. Yeah, get to the yeah. show. Say goodbye to everybody. It's packed up. Get on the bus and go. And then <laughs> people like me. Yeah, next time you're in, uh, you know, uh, yeah. Boise, you stop over. And they yeah, stop over. And you, you I know. Stop. Yeah. I know. Then you're like running from, especially if you have a tight tour where you're running from day to day. And it's like, yeah, you, you just want to like yeah, go back to the best of sleep. <laughs> we got all kinds of invitations. Yeah, you swing by when you're on tour. Swing by. There's no swinging anywhere, bro. We gotta we gotta go from one gig to the other. <laughs> yeah, that's how it works. It's yeah, really awesome. Good. Well, um, tell people how they can find you online. I know you've got your website, right? Yeah, that's BillySheen.com. It's just kind of a placeholder. Mm -hmm. My my, you can click email me there, and it comes to me. Okay. I think it's got a link to my Facebook and other stuff, but it's just kind of because no, it's not so much a website thing. It's mostly Facebook, Instagram. Sure. Twitter. Yeah. That seems to be the, I mean, that's the, I mean, we actually trade messages on, on, uh, on Facebook periodically. Yeah. And uh, it's interesting it's because you can, what's that? Sorry. So, that's why this isn't happening. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. And it's, it's cool because now, I mean, I'm in touch with a lot of people that you'd never think you would normally be in touch with Leland and Marcus and all these guys that right. it, way back when you wouldn't be able to really get a hold of them. You have to go through managers, you know? Yeah. I like the no manager thing. Matter of fact, uh, the only thing is hard for sometimes is setting up interviews because right. people, sure. and like I know you, so it, it, and you caught me at a good time. So, yeah. uh, but sometimes people write to me, Hey, can you do an interview? Yeah. Uh, yeah. But when I go, you tell me, right? Well, yeah. Time. And then I, and then I don't have a publicist texting me going, you got an interview in five minutes. You got to do it. So in the meantime, <laughs> I'm recording and doing stuff. And next thing you know, I, I get a, a message. So, so are you there? And I go, I'm not even home. What? Oh, the interview. I forgot. Yeah. I yeah. So it's coordinated help. So I, I, I've made many, I had to make many apologies for forgetting, <laughs> but um, I try, I, I try to try to write it all down on my, my lengthy to-do list. Here. Yeah, you know what? It's funny because I have lists. I email myself all day long trying to like. Oh, I remember right. this. <laughs> well, thank you so much for um, for doing this. I really appreciate it, and I think um, oh, it's, my it's pleasure. It's awesome. Um, you know, you have such a influence and and have been an influential player for so many years. And I think it's awesome that, you know, and also when we've met in person, like Bass Player Live in LA, um, you have such a great spirit and you can tell that you still have a passion for what you do, which I think is really awesome and exciting. Thanks. Yeah, I, 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 that's my, the gift I'm most grateful for is the fact that I, I love doing it. Yeah. And I'll sit down here in my studio, down in my man cave and go for hours and hours and get in the garage. I got my little amp set up. So I turn awesome. it down and play. Yeah there and feed the chipmunks so it just a lot, <laughs> a lot of playing a lot of playing and a yeah. lot of my itunes is over two terabytes of music and great it's a it's, it's a great thing I'm, yeah. I'm grateful for a lot but the just the fact that i that i still in, enjoy it it's still exciting to me right I'll i get my iphone and we'll set it up in a, a selfie video Right. And I'm working on something. I'll set it down and explain. And okay, the the chorus is right here, and then it goes in. You know, and so I got it. Yeah, thousands of little song snippets and licks and. That's food. awesome. Yes. It's it's great. Like I said, like having you, know, you can feel your passion, which I think is awesome, and that's that's something that I think hopefully we all strive to. Whatever you do, if it's music, or if it's art, or whatever it is, yeah. that's you. Yeah. yeah. So thank you so much for joining joining me, Billy. Oh, I appreciate my it. Pleasure. My pleasure. Um. I'm sorry. Good to, good to speak with you again. And uh, let's stay in touch. And whatever else you might need from me, uh, you know how to get in touch. 
Awesome. And then Thank anyone you. wants to get in touch, just so they know, on Facebook with a little blue check mark, verified. Right. Uh, Instagram, I think I'm verified there too, and Twitter mm -hmm. as well. Yeah. If you write to me, I get it, I see it. It's not somebody else. And I I I answer almost everything. And right. it is a gargantuan task. And <laughs> yeah, I can, I but yeah. I, I I'm very, very grateful that people are kind enough to get in touch with me. So it's the least I can do it at least fire a thumbs up back or a thank you back. So if anybody wants to get in touch, uh, please do. Awesome. All right. Thank you so much, Billy. I really appreciate it. My pleasure. We'll see you very soon. All right. Ciao. Bye.